All right. Welcome back from the break. I hope you enjoyed the chats and the coffee. Perhaps the chats more than the coffee, I would suspect, but here we are for panel two, the effects of denial in post-conflict societies. For this panel, we will have another dear colleague of mine, Darlene Seda, as our moderator, which we are, as always, very thankful for. The panel will not de deal with denial in its let me call it regular form, the way we experience it here in Germany nowadays. No, indeed, we will look at more particular, more danger-prone areas, such as the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and also Rwanda, and how denial affects those regions and those societies. Now, before I hand over to the panel, I would once again encourage for you to submit questions online as well as in person. And here we already have the poll. Anti-denial laws protect societies effectively. Agree or disagree? Again, please submit your vote from now until the end of the panel when we will get back to it. Thank you very much. And now over to Darlene. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, welcome everyone to the second panel. After very interesting and fantastic discussions, um, looking at the theoretical aspects of um, this year's forum, uh, this panel is going to look at more the practical sides um, of genocide denial. And the theme of this panel is going to look at the effects of genocide denial in post-conflict societies. Um, as a brief introduction, Genocide denial has gained more mainstream approval in various forms, through members of a perpetrator group or outside of a perpetrator group, whether at an indiv individual level or collective level, whether as cultural or official denial. Whatever the case may be, we can all agree that genocide denial has become an impediment to reconstruction and reconciliation of post-conflict societies. Some are of the view that genocide denial is the final phase of commission of uh, genocide. Others, like uh, Dr. Bramert, yesterday mentioned that his view is that genocide denial is a continuation of perpetration of this heinous crime without the physical aspect of it. So this panel is going to look at why is genocide denial occurring and what are the effects of this on post-conflict society. I'm very delighted and honored to introduce uh, this panel. Um, I will start to my extreme right, um, uh, Mr. Christian Schmidt, who is uh, the current high representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Welcome, Mr. Schmidt. May I ask you for your one-liner on your thoughts about the topic of this panel? Thank you. Thank you very much. First, I uh, would like uh, to thank to be uh, invited to participate and uh, probably just stress to one singular experience among all us sitting here at the panel, uh, because I was, uh, Christoph Safferling, one of these few in the time in between, as this was a regular uh, room for jurisdiction that I could uh, contribute sitting here uh, in civilian cases. Uh, I think must have been in the year 79, 80, um, uh, and uh, we got as well in this time the feeling that there has to be done, has to be done more about these issues we are talking. Uh, we had in our country, we in our country now, Germany, one super advantage, Stephen Rapp, the Americans, because you made us not discussing and muddling through but confronting with what has happened. And I think this was the basis uh, which so far took, uh, we took a lot of advantage. I'm doubting whether we have now in these days, Christoph Safferling has already referred to it, um, some signs that uh, in the second, third generation, the impact of the uh, disaster, traumatic, uh, humanitarian genocide um, um, uh, experience uh, is losing a little bit on momentum. 
we have never had in Bosnia-Herzegovina this possibility of sit down and having, let me say, an hour zero. Monika Supasic just has de described yesterday about her experience. We have not, like we're sitting here now in Nuremberg, thinking how is genocide denial re legally to be seen um, more theoretically. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, you have all the understandable emotions of those who have been affected, and I could imagine this is exactly the same in Rwanda, um, where uh, we have to answer. So this what is a need um, to, I don't want to say reconcile, but to bring the awareness uh, that the, um, the respect and honor to the victims has to be uh, um, contributed as well by, the, uh, by uh, legal and not only in a society discussion about how to behave as somebody who has uh, contributed to the genocide or to war crimes or to crimes against humanity. I think this is, a, 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 this is now um, just making clear that I'm personally, I'm supporting, not only supporting, I have worked on this to have the legislation which my predecessor, Valentin Insko, um, uh, has uh, uh, given three years ago that I th uh, say this is right. And additionally, I think we have uh, a little bit to substitute the non-existing social coherence in the society by a look ahead of the um, repressive criminal law. What is the basis of uh, prevention? We have, by the way, uh, see that the general prevention does work with the legislation, but probably this is more not due to any insight, but that the tradition in this region of the world is very focused on authorities and uh, on um, uh, some consequences if you do not follow. So I would say basically, uh, we have a very different problem because uh, never ever uh, we all, including in the national uh, community, managed to bring off um, uh, the differentiation between the ethnic uh, origin of young people. They are getting different curricula, incredible, but it is the case. And uh, so we have to act in a multifold approach including prevention of uh, genocide, uh, but as well using the tool of repressive criminal law um, uh, in respect um, uh, to a uh, possibility of building a society more, um, more agreeing about the history than it is now. It's a basically a full dispute and it's politically instrumentalized. Um, and uh, so there we are. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. Um, I will then move to introduce uh, Ms. Alice Wairimunderitu, um, who is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide to the United Nations. Welcome, Ms. Nderitu. Um, maybe your one-liner um, of your thoughts summarizing the topic of this uh, panel, and then once I finish introdu introducing the next panelist, then we can uh, dive in into the specific questions for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad to be on this panel. I'm appreciating again. So I would say in, in regard to the denial of genocide, and not just the denial of any genocide, denial of genocide as uh, has been proven conclusively in courts of law that uh, it has happened, that we should take that very, very seriously because it constitutes in itself um, preparation uh, for another genocide. It speaks to the risk factors, to the indicators and risk factors uh, for genocide, and we do know for a fact that the past impacts the present and informs the future. 
And so denial of, of genocide really speaks to that core of understanding how the past uh, impacts the present and informs the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Nderitu. Um, now to my farthest left, um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Emable Havugiaremia, who is the Prosecutor General of the Republic of Rwanda. Welcome, Mr. Havugiaremia. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but please, to your one-liner. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Denying genocide is stabbing in the wounds of victims and survivors. Fighting genocide denial is not a struggle of one day. It's not a struggle of one week or one year. It's a lifetime struggle. And every one of us in every generation must do our role. Thank you. And last but not least, um, Dr. Serge Bramatz, who is the Chief Prosecutor, United Nations International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, and also is the Vice President of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Academy. Dr. Bramatz, your one-liner. Thank you very much. My one-liner yesterday was uh, genocide denial is the continuation of the genocide. So I will take another one for today and saying that genocide denial is in fact a political tool to divide societies. Thank you so much, Dr. Bramat. Um, so I would like to have a very general introduction on the topic of genocide denial. And I think um, I will direct this first question to Dr. Bramatz and Ms. Naritu. Um, the two of, of you have been very outspoken um, in expressing alarm um, on the harm caused by genocide denial. Um, Dr. Bramatz, yesterday during your panel moderation, you mentioned that genocide denial has become worse in the last 15 years. So the question is, why do you think genocide denial is occurring and what are the reasons for it becoming worse in the last 15 years? Maybe Ms. Nderitu, you can start us off and then um, Dr. Bramas can take over. Thank you. It's all very contextual uh, why genocide denial is, uh, is happening. And um, as you say uh, correctly, that Saj and I have really been speaking out uh, very strongly because we see this, uh, especially in the context of, of Rwanda, in the context of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, in the wider Balkans. And uh, for, for Rwanda, it's in the wider, especially DRC, um, and the Great Lakes region. And it, it's happening because um, partly, as, as I said, it's a political tool. Um, it's used mainly by political actors who want to advance uh, an agenda. Um, political um, parties and politicians um, use uh, genocide denial as a way of advancing um, their interests of creating fear in the population so that uh, there is fear among those who the genocide already happened, but also fear among those who the perpetrators. And um, so they project themselves as the people who will protect um, those who, especially the, the perpetrators. And I say perpetrators because we do know that court processes are only able to take um, only so much. So court processes are able to take um, people with the highest level of responsibility, um, which therefore means that uh, among uh, post-genocidal societies, there are a lot of people walking around who actually participated in genocides, but were not held to account. And uh, when we speak about the propagation of uh, this genocide ideology, you see it happening um, mostly um, at that level. And so the, the, when the politicians speak, they are speaking to an ecosystem that is friendly to the fact of genocide denial because they, they participated, they were not held to account and then they then get put out there as, um, as, as, um, as the face of, of, of really uh, the worst nightmare of uh, what happened already to these uh, people who uh, went through the genocide. And, and it can take very strong um, angles in the, the reasons we've been talking mostly about Rwanda and, uh, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
where criminal, international criminal tribunals conclusively proved that genocide happened. Um, we saw, we've seen, for example, the treatment uh, of, of uh, or, or the behavior of people who've been released from prison, people convicted uh, for the crime of genocide, and they leave prison completely unremorseful, um, and they going back to societies that are welcoming to them, uh, welcoming to the genocide ideology that put them in the prison in the first place. We've seen, like in Bosnia, has a governor, um, this uh, professor of. Uh, of biology who uh, was convicted. And when she was released, um, she was um, received actually by the then uh, chair of the presidency, uh, Dodik. He received her with a presidential jet, flew her, um, celebrated her. We've seen uh, war criminals um, celebrated um, in, in um, many parts of Republika Srpska. Um, awards um, named after them, um, the, their murals, um, everywhere. I saw that in Belgrade too, Ratko Mladic's mural um, put up everywhere, dividing uh, the country. In, in, in Rwanda, um, we, we see also the, the, the same aspect of uh, genocide denial. This one very strongly in a whispering campaign uh, that is then spread out um, in the region that alleges that the genocide um, um, against the Tutsi did not happen, yet we saw it happen um, from the region we were there, it happened in living memory. And, and part of it also can be um, explained uh, in terms of um, the two countries, the, what um, happened to them um, in terms of the transitional justice process. Um, part of it incomplete, like for Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, with a country with a constitution that is modeled on the Dayton uh, Peace Agreement. Um, which was in itself a ceasefire document, which defines the three constituent peoples of, um, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And, and so kind of silos um, those three peoples. And then um, a different um, approach in Rwanda, where you have um, uh, the, the, the thinking of um, Rwandans was, we are actually one people, we speak the same language, we have the same culture, uh, we may have different clans, like many other people do, but we are the same people. So therefore, we are going to concentrate on being Rwandans and see whether that will in itself uh, prevent another genocide. And, and so just thinking about those two contexts and, and the difference, um, but also seeing the larger picture of uh, the fact of the criminal justice system not being in a position anywhere to handle all these perpetrators. Um, who are part of uh, genocides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nerito. Dr. Bramitz. Thank you. If you ask me today why I think that today in the former Yugoslavia more people, more individuals are denying the genocide, if you ask me why it is like this, I would say it is because they can and they can do it with full impunity. Um, what are the reasons? I think there are many, many of them. I remember very well when, when Karadzic was representing himself at the opening statement, right? He was saying, I'm not standing here as an individual, I'm standing here to represent my people. And this, I think, is the fundamental problem, especially with high-level perpetrators who always try to escape their individual criminal responsibility by saying, I'm not here to represent myself, I'm here to represent my people. And we have seen in prosecutions also domestically, if it is about the killing of one individual or one case of rape, more or less everyone agrees that a prosecution is legitimate because people can understand. The higher you go in the ranks in terms of a general or politicians, the closer this individual is to the government of the society, the more difficult it is for people to accept that they were politically following someone who at the end of the day brought him into a much, a much larger, much larger conflict. Um, the second element I, I want to mention is in relation to the, uh, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Uh, I remember in, you know, I was uh, chief prosecutor in Brussels in the late 90s when we had our first, first cases, uh, universal jurisdiction in Belgium at that time. 
And we had the Le Quatre de Boutare, the, one of the first cases, two religious sisters and two other individuals prosecuted. And it was for me the first time that I was moving from terrorism and organized crime cases where you thought that there are some rules or where there's a certain understanding about the political objective or the financial objective for the first time a genocide case. And I just want to quote from, from one of the statements we took from one of the perpetrators. We're not going into details about the crime as such, but it was a, a building which was an annex to a church and a kind of monastery where many hundreds of um, Tutsi had found refuge, mainly women and children, but where those religious sisters, uh, at least one of them, called the Inderhamwe, who started the killings, mainly with manchetas. And they would go in in the morning into this building, which was closed from all sides, would all day kill individuals with their manchetas. At five o'clock, they would close the entire building, put guards around, would go home, and would come back the next day. Right? And they would do this for, for, for five days. So we interviewed one of the perpetrators, and we said, so you would be killing uh, women and children and, and elderly people from morning to the evening, and do you go home? Yeah. So you have a wife? Yes. You have children? Yes. So you go home, you stay with your wife, with your own children, and the next morning you are getting up, have breakfast with your family, you go there and you continue the killings. And you do this during five days. And his response was, yeah, I mean, people were not very cooperative. If they had been more cooperative, we could have done it in three days. Um, the point I want to make is that genocide and everything which is linked to those massive crimes allows those who are in charge to convince others that they do not deserve to live and they are not really human beings and that in fact it's a form of collective self-defense to kill those individuals which when you kill one person it is an assassination and you try to destroy an entire group it is your own group's self-defense and this is really this important dimension and this important this difference we, we, we have to make to really explain why uh, it is so important. And that's why I think the closer you are to the survivors and the victims, and the more you see how much it is insulting, how much it is a slap into the face of the survivors to allow politicians to do genocide denial, I think the closer you are, the more you are in favor of punishment, criminalization, uh, in particular in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where it is political mainstream for the majority of parties and countries to glorify war criminals, deny genocide, and to insult victims every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bramatz. I think both of you make uh, an extremely important point, which um, uh, Mun uh, Munira also pointed out yesterday, that genocide denial is made possible when there's two reasons. Um, receptive audience and outside confirmation. Um, maybe to speak um, in the specific context, uh, I can turn to you, uh, Pro Mr. Prosecutor General. In the case of Rwanda, um, genocide denial is seen as a big, if not a, the biggest threat to national security. My question then will be, we have heard that in the case of Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina, um, most of the genocide, genocide deniers are politicians. What is the situation like in Rwanda, considering also how strict the laws of genocide denial are present in Rwanda? Uh, thank you. Uh, in the context of Rwanda, genocide in denial is really a threat to security. Maybe a better understanding uh, of this context uh, requires uh, understanding a bit the historical background that led to the 1994 genocide against Tutsi. As a historical background, before colonization, Rwanda was an organized country. Uh, and the identity uh, that we had was Rwandans, but we had also clans. Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa, they were social classes. So with the politics of divide and rule of colonizers, they turned the social classes into ethnic group, groups. Then they gave favors to Tutsi, uh, especially in, uh, 
in relation to education and administration. So in the 50s, uh, the educated people started claiming independence. And then the colonizers, the Belgians, they switched the favors from Tutsi to Hutu and mobilized Hutus to be against Tutsi. And that's worked well in given the context because they were telling them they are the ones who have been favored. And that's led to actually killing Tutsis and the mass exodus in 1959. Those Tutsi who remained in Rwanda, they were segregated, persecuted, killed on different occasions, and had limited access to education, administration, and in, uh, in state security organs. On October, on 1st October 1990, those who had fled the country started a liberation war. And then uh, the hate speeches were intensified. Tutsi were considered, as it has been mentioned by uh, 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 Honore yesterday, they were called snakes or cockroach. In the African culture or in the Rwandan con context, uh, a snake is a symbol of the devil. So that's they were giving message like those people who are snakes, who are cockroaches, they are creatures that must be destroyed. So, and it's during that time between 1990 and 94 that the genocide against Tutsi was planned with the incitement to commit genocide. So when the genocide was stopped uh, in uh, July 1994, the country was completely destroyed without hope for future. The symbols of our nations were trauma, fear, and broken hearts. So as Rwandans, it, we, with the, that situation, we, we had two ways to respond to that situation. The first way to respond to that, that situation was to react with bitterness which would lead to revenge, and that was really possible. The second way to respond to our situation was, and as our suffering mounted, we realized that what we need is to turn our suffering into creative force. And actually, we said, we will no longer accept the things we cannot change, but we will change the things we can no longer accept. And that required sacrifice. Even those victims and survivors had to be convinced that they have to forgive. If you want to build our country, we had, we, there were policies of unity and reconciliation. And we said we will no longer, Serge had just mentioned that uh, genocide denial is a political tool to divide the society. We, we have experienced it. And we said, because genocide denial is uh, taking us back to the horrific and tragic history the aim is to make us fail, and we, we, we have refused to fail. We have to build our nation. That's the reason why we are serious when it comes to fighting against genocide denial, because it's taking us back to the history and can bring back the bitterness of those who survived the genocide. Thank you.
um, uh, Mr. Prosecutor General. Maybe um, we can turn and look um, at the Bosnia and Herzegovina um, situation. Um, as it has been said already, politicians, especially in this context, are the number one genocide deniers. Um, there was a report that was published by the Independent International Commission on of inquiry on the sufferings of all peoples in uh, Srebrenica region. And this uh, agency was set up by uh, the government, the Republika uh, Srebska. And the idea of this, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea of this commission was to was created to seek and cast doubt on whether thousands of Bosniaks uh, who were murdered by the Bosnian Serbs uh, were considered as innocent civilians. So hearing um, the experiences of genocide survivors. And uh, again, Monira Subasic yesterday mentioned um, this idea of having a receptive audience and outside confirmation. My question then to you will be, do you think this report, if it did exist, and if it in its current context, um, do you think this report had an impact on the growth um, of receptive audience in the Bosnian context? Is there, is there um, the number of genocide deniers accepting um, this idea of denying and glorifying war criminals? Did this uh, report by this independent commission have an impact on the growth um, of genocide denial in the Bosnian context? Thank you. Yes, as I have no empiric evidence, I cannot really uh, answer yes or no. I would have the impression that this is uh, uh, in the understanding of those promoting genocide denial uh, could, could help th some, uh, them in their, in, in, in their wrong approach. But I think uh, indeed we have to go um, deeper. What brings us, what tools do we have to bring um, this understanding put in a critical um, check? We, we are living in a society in Bosnia-Herzegovina where with all respect, and I think all those coming out of the society uh, hopefully will agree with me, but there is a dramatic uh, failure of knowledge, of historical knowledge, of relations, understanding, and um, this does not make it easy to avoid such uh, impact of any studies. Um, come back one, again, once, only one on board again to uh, what happened here 45, 46, and the following so-called denazification in Germany was paired with the uh, concept of re-education to bring more political information and discussion uh, to the broader um, uh, people, to the citizens. This worked out, out we have a lack of this in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So basically you can say I'm really convinced that if we would invest more in this, we could achieve something. In the moment, I see, and in the moment I think the repressive approach is unavoidable. Um, so this is why I have to say that I will not only support and continue and keep the amendments to the uh, penalty law, to the criminal law of Bosnia-Herzegovina my predecessor has given, but I will extend. Why? Um, especially this impact of those people who have been sentenced at uh, um, uh, Serge Bramatz um, uh, at the ICTY, now after most of them 15, 20 years, now they are, most of them they are off. They are behaving in a feeling as somebody said, a politician, uh, she said, um, they have got um, rehabilitation. Uh, so this is a wrong understanding about the sense um, uh, of uh, sentencing and about the continuation of uh, somehow an exclusion out of the political and public process. So I will add this, uh, and we will have together with the residual mechanism, I think a good way now to implement in the National Register, which is not up to date, not, not the case, 
uh, those who have been sentenced that they uh, can. Uh, this is public and uh, can bear consequences. So this is on the top level, if you want to say. Uh, the other level, level is that I think we have to work on definition about hate speech and about uh, denial. <clears throat> we have started training. Um, uh, no, I do not say training. I say exchange of uh, uh, impressions. Now, uh, for example, um, uh, Andrea Sporger, she is uh, uh, the responsible for, for, for all this uh, uh, issues in my, my, my office, we had invited prosecutors, chief prosecutors, in this case from Bavaria, just to discuss about hate speech, to discuss about genocide denial. And um, uh, I'm learning that there is a need for more information of prosecutors. Prosecutors in Bosnia-Herzegovina do not come to a case. They hear a police is very reserved to come to a case. And <clears throat> if you have any street naming, um, named again, uh, uh, or following up Mr. Karacic and Mr. Mladic, there is <clears throat> not a, let me say, a regional mechanism which we would expect in a state of law society that things are going and following. It's not that the norm and the criminal code would not give possibility to do, but it is not, I shouldn't say accepted, yes, but it's not seen as a kind of priority. And <clears throat> so the legalistic, uh, legal principle uh, of prosecutors is not followed. I don't want to blame them. Somehow they are more res uh, reflecting uh, and mirroring the situation in a society um, as uh, they're only saying they are, they are weak people. But this brings me that we have to change this uh, in <clears throat> making influence to the administration, which is um, uh, due to the situation that some of the positions have to be composed not of keeping one, but three <clears throat> or four <clears throat> of uh, uh, those officers uh, uh, doing their job or not doing their job, that we have to go for state of law very, very committedly and for training, training, training. Um, if I do not see re-education fully, we have to go for an education of the juridical sector. And um, uh, this is lack. So, uh, and there you need a commitment. Um, uh, and you can put it on the responsibility of the political class in Bosnia-Herzegovina, because most of their time they are managing uh, some progress in block to European integration, but they are uh, managing just to overcome the blockade of one of them. This is uh, mostly uh, Serbia, not uh, uh, Srpska, uh, not in all cases. But so I think we have, uh, uh, um, uh, Madame Nidjegi, to re refer to Dayton. Dayton is a very complicated structure um, uh, in executing and implementing it. So this is quite another point we should not focus on today. My plea is that we have to look, revisit um, a Dayton, and we should do this ahead of giving us the promises to have Bosnia-Herzegovina as full member in European <laughs> Union. Um, sometimes, um, uh, please allow me, uh, that when I'm reading that the opinion of the European Commission, which is a very found one from 2019, said um, uh, this um, country, uh, in one of these 14 priorities and the pretext, um, uh, had to recover from the war. No, has to recover from the war. This is the key uh, uh, difference in the wording. You can, we are Europeans attending to take this more functional, to say, okay, let's go only for any rules and they will be followed. No, the rules will not be followed because the, the, the healing after the war hasn't taken place. Um, uh, so this is a multifold approach, uh, but uh, I see definitely that we need um, uh, the contribution and the toolbox of repressive means uh, to give uh, the victims or those the ordinary society uh, 
uh, who are interested just to live in peace, to live in peace not only with a neighbor, but in a, in a peaceful society, that we give them advantage uh, in comparison to some uh, narratives, intentions, unfortunately politicians put on them, which are only ethno-nationalistic based uh, narratives sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a quick one about um, the reports, the Republika Srpska um, report that um, you've, you've mentioned and um, in support of uh, the Office of the High Representative, that I think it's important to note that um, when this report was being prepared, including through a whole commission of inquiry to prove that um, this genocide uh, that happened in Srebrenica did not happen, um, to really disprove um, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that um, part of the participants and uh, very strong participants were Holocaust deniers and that uh, the template of Holocaust denial was very present in the writing of this report. And so when, when you look at the arguments that are used by Holocaust deniers, you see them reflected by the deniers of, um, of the Srebrenica genocide. You see them reflected as well by the deniers of uh, the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. And, and I think it's extremely important to see the link um, in which um, when Republika Srpska was writing the report, they felt it was important to look for Holocaust deniers to contribute to this report. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Schmidt and uh, Ms. Nderitu for that uh, very important context also um, on this commission report. Um, maybe one additional question, uh, Dr. Bramat, um, and uh, Mr. Prosecutor General. Um, this commission report also uh, has accused, and I would think that it's obviously propagated by um, the politicians in Bosnia. They accuse the UN Mechanism Tribunal um, for staging uh, political bias tri uh, trials in Bosnian, Bosnian Serb political and military leaders and wrongly classifying uh, Srebrenica massacres as genocide. Um, I would be interested to know your thoughts about um, how does this affect or impact your work as prosecutor, especially in the investigation phase and the trial phase? How does genocide denial and rampant genocide denial impact your work as um, prosecutor? You know, just to, to, to try to explain a little bit more these this reports, these denial uh, reports. You know, when we look at, um, at the genocides in the former Yugoslavia or in, in Rwanda, the perpetrators, when committing the massive crimes, were already at that time trying to destroy traces of the existence of the groups. So, which means that municipal records were destroyed in Rwanda, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, the uh, places of religion were, were destroyed. So, to destroy already the visible signs of existence of a group. Then, in a second phase, we have um, the genocide denial, uh, afterwards saying that the crimes never happened and that those decisions are not right. What we have seen, and the report is part of it, is if genocide denial is not working well enough to create a new factual reality. We have seen that some individuals, for example, in relation to the Makale incident in in Bosnia, in, in Sarajevo, where um, through a record attack, uh, an important group of people were killed. Well, doing exercises more recently on military uh, ground, making uh, tests to factually prove that in fact the crime could not have happened. In fact, it is part of the exactly same strategy of uh, genocide denial. What is it doing uh, to, to a prosecutor? Well, it just means for us that we need to work even, even harder. Uh, we have, of course, our judgment, our decisions, but I think the key word has been mentioned several times. It's education. Education at, at all levels in the countries where the crimes have been committed and uh, outside. You know, we're always saying that it's, um, it's a form of absurdity that the genocide in Srebrenica is part of teaching books over everywhere in the world, except in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It doesn't really, really make any, any sense. And now I'm trying to, please. Thank you, Dr. Bramitz. Would you, do you have anything? 
Anything to add to that point? How does this affect your work as prosecutor when uh, genocide denial is very rampant in the Rwandan context at least? Uh, there is uh, something that is uh, emotional because um, we are Rwandans. We, we, we know what happened to us. Uh, one, uh, when it comes to prosecuting uh, the genocide denial, we have uh, ways to remember that it's uh, giving value to the sacrifice of victims and uh, survivors. And uh, it's a collective responsibility to hold uh, those who commit the, deny the crime of genocide denial to hold them accountable. But again, um, in, the, in the context uh, of Rwanda, in general, uh, as a rule of thumb, is that uh, criminals always uh, try to hide their actions. And uh, when confronted to the truth, they deny the, the fact. So it is, it is done in the context of hiding evidence, but again, uh, in the context of expect, uh, escaping justice by confusing the public and countries harboring them on what exactly happened in Rwanda and creating uh, deliberate uh, ambiguity. So uh, that's the reason why you will hear some, at the beginning, uh, they tried shooting up, to shooting the, shutting the truth up and uh, keeping silent about uh, <coughs> plans of genocide. And later, what I can even call like uh, an interpretative denial, the killings were accepted but uh, were explained in the context of civil war or inter-ethnic conflict. And then, and then later, uh, they started the implicatory denial, which is the current situation we are in now. They accept the genocide, but they try to blame the, the, the other side, claiming double genocide. And what, uh, what is sad is that they use even people. An example would be, for instance, uh, uh, a documentary fil a film entitled Untold Story. That's denial of genocide. And it was done by BBC. Or even some books like uh, In Praise of Blood by Judy River. That's genocide denial. And when you follow it, you, you, that's where you see how it is being used as a political tool to destroy uh, our nation. And when it comes to prosecuting those crimes, then we have to have it in mind that we are doing it to build our history. We are doing it to avoid coming back to the divisionism because we want to build a Rwanda we want where everyone can feel like a Rwandan, not see people in the context of ethnic groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps maybe um, talking about criminalization and the effect of criminalization and staying with the context of Rwanda, um, Rwanda has very strong, if you may, uh, legislation on genocide denial, but it has also faced a lot of criticism um, on its application, um, its vagueness, it's very vague and very broad, not very clear. And if I may quote um, the Rwandan Supreme Court, um, who in 2012 acknowledged that the concept of genocide mini minimization in the 2003 law in fact lacks the precision necessary to meet the standards set by the constitution and international law, but it failed to clarify 
um, further what this means. Um, additionally, the Supreme Court also made clear that intent has to be proven to find someone guilty of genocide minimization in Rwanda. So two questions for you. Um, how does implementation of genocide denial laws look like in Rwanda now? And has there been any amendments to the 2003 law that take into account uh, the Supreme Court's opinion on this? Yes, uh, let me start by saying that uh, in relation to the first law, that was a law uh, against uh, genocide ideology that includes um, genocide denial. We had two kinds uh, or two types of criticism. A few criticized the law with uh, an objective mind of improving the law. And uh, that's, that's something normal. Uh, before becoming a prosecutor general, I was involved in legislative drafting. There is no perfect law. And sometimes you can realize the loopholes when you started to apply those, law, those laws. And uh, that was the context of that Supreme Court judgment. The purpose was to improve uh, the law. The second type of criticism is, uh, uh, is from people who did not want that we criminalize the, the genocide denial and, uh, or genocide ideology with uh, related, related crimes. Of course, they talked about the vagueness, but they added that it is against freedom of expression. So that's the second type of criticism. So we, we, he, he, for us, uh, for those who had those criticism with uh, that objective mind of improving the law, we really did it. And uh, the law was improved. And uh, now we do have a recent law of 2018 in relation to genocide ideology. Something that is very interesting to mention First is the scope of, 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 that, of, that, of that law. It's not limited to genocide against Tutsi. It's genocide in general, including the genocide against Tutsi, any recognized genocide by the UN or international courts, or any other act leading to genocide. That's the scope of the law. It's not limited to only genocide ideology. It includes other genocide, meaning that even, for instance, even the denial of Holocaust can be punished using this law. And we were expecting other countries to do the same. Because sometimes when it comes uh, to fighting genocide denial, Sometimes we, we, we feel alone, whereas we have expanded that law so that it can also pa pa punish it. Again, another improvement to avoid uh, vagueness, because in the first law, uh, there were some broader terms, and we realized that when we started to, to, up, uh, to, to apply it, was even the definition in relation to the definition of genocide ideology, where we added uh, some component uh, that the act must be committed in public, and we even defined what public means, like publications on websites, social media, in media, a message sent to a person, a person uh, recorded audio or video performed by use of uh, appropriate devices, devices, and any other publication through information and uh, communication technology. And the act must be an act that uh, manifests an ideology that supports or advocates the destruction in whole or in part, as it is in the definition of the genocide. So there were those precisions to avoid ambi uh, 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 ambiguity. So the law has really been improved. Thank you.
Um, maybe you can also uh, give us a context of how the criminalization of genocide denial in Bosnia works um, following on the legislation that was passed by your predecessor, who, which also um, had a lot of criticism uh, based on it being passed on the last day before um, you took over. Maybe you can touch on that a bit. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, this was a very interesting time when um, I have to say that uh, my predecessor had a lot of, um, let me say, value-oriented question to himself. And I think some people have helped him very much uh, to go through. International community was, by the way, reserved. Uh, it made things in the understanding of some people more complicated. Today, I can so say it has not made it complicated because we are following this value-oriented um, a consequence of denial, not the denial itself, but the, um, um, the incitement and the, uh, uh, the consequence for the society. These are uh, uh, the areas where we talk and we have to see this is a challenging legal approach. So you need indeed to come back to more training. On the other side, we see that there are attempts of just um, uh, academically deny. This is um, not in the part of in the framework of this uh, legislation or to reduce. By the way, Holocaust um, denial history in Germany as well shows uh, plenty of ideas that, that never have, ever could have been in such a huge number and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, we recently, two, last year, we had a, a study of a re, uh, renowned uh, international Holocaust researcher, Guido and Greif, um, who was asked uh, on charge of the Republika Srpska authorities to uh, review somehow, refuse my wording, um, uh, Srebrenica. And astonishingly, he came not uh, to the figure of more than 8,000 people uh, killed, but he ended, I think, around with 3,000, which is just putting into question the, the, the facts. So it could be, uh, let me say, avoided or brought in a public discussion that this is not accepted. We were, uh, I, I think today he is more to justify himself why he came to this. But uh, this is where we have to keep as well academic and public discussion. What I said to extend the experience is that the general preventive aspect works out. Um, the longer a law is in force, the less the general uh, preventive aspect uh, is visible. Uh, so I think we have to look more on the special preventive uh, uh, or uh, reactive uh, way. This means that uh, first I have uh, to strengthen those uh, who have uh, um, uh, to uh, implement. And the second is that um, uh, uh, I will uh, go for not allowing uh, that those who have uh, been sentenced, um, uh, that they are, can take any public position any longer. Uh, this is only a, a small token. Um, we as well have to go um, to intensify the question of, um, um, of just compensation, whatever compensation means to those um, uh, uh, who have, uh, be, have suffered. This is a, just a civic rights situation where we are talking about this. I think this could as well contribute to a more public understanding that there has been a lot of uh, 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 unjustified um, uh, damage and uh, terror and torture. And um, third is that uh, I, I, I think uh, we uh, have to bring, um, uh, should I say, internationalize the issue. Uh, we should 
give more and have here in Rwanda, it seems a little bit a similar situation. Um, uh, that the public is just looking as an, this would be only Rwanda and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia-Herzegovina has a very broad uh, diaspora. And um, so far, I see, I think this could be as well uh, a way to heal, not in legislation, but in offering them more, going into what has happened uh, in another environment, in Europe, in the US, or wherever, in, in, in Africa, wherever it is in the world, um, just uh, to contribute. But about the repressive issues, extension and better implementation um, uh, and indictments uh, were necessary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schmidt. So our one hour of discussion has elapsed and now we welcome questions from the audience and um, those who are watching online. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Monira, someone please. Um. I'll mute. Ja ću malo samo prokomentarisati, neću nikako pitanje postavljati. Prvo da kažem da Dejton koji je donešen u Bosnu i Hercegovinu 1995. godine, on je zaustavio rat. First of all, I would like to make a comment, not ask question. And I would like to say that the Dayton Peace Agreement that was adopted in 1995 brought an end, war to an end. Ali nama žrtvama borba još uvijek traje. But the fight for us, for victims, still is ongoing. Često puta naši političari Dayton nekako stavljaju kao švedski sto, pa uzmaju iz Daytona samo ono što njima odgovara. We have a feeling that politicians nowadays, our politicians, consider or approach Dayton peace agreement as a Swedish table, as a banquet, so to say, a buffet, and they take what they like and they leave what they don't like. Anex 7, gdje smo trebali svi da se vratimo na svoja ognjišta, samo 2% se je vratilo građana u entitet Republika Srpska. Based on the Anex 7, all of us should have been back to our initial place where we lived, but at the moment it's around 2% of people who have returned to their previous homes. A i oni koji se vratili imaju strašne probleme, jer oni koji su ubijali njihovu djecu, silovali njih, oni su sad u policiji, u zdravstvu, u tužbi, čak što više ljekari koji ih liječe i oni prepoznavaju žrtve njih kao zločince. And those two percent that have returned to their homes are now in a different type of trouble because where they live, where they exercise their rights, they are facing... People who have committed crimes, who now work in the police force, in the prosecutor's office, um, in, um, in, in the medical department, in, in hospitals. So they are now treating them uh, on a daily basis. Veliki broj povratnika koji se vratili su ubijeni i nikad ni jedan slučaj nije doveden do kraja, ni se pronašlo koji to uradio. Uh, there is a number of people who have been killed once returned to their homes and until this moment not a single of those investigations was completed and so far never has it been discovered who killed them. And this commission that was mentioned, that was formed, uh, was presided by uh, a professor from, from Germany. And I haven't heard anyone, uh, even the human rights organization, that basically uh, raised their voice against this. Mene je to strašno kao žrtvu zabrinjava, jer ako mi nemamo dobro školstvo, da u školama se uči prava istina i ono sve što se je dešavalo 90. godina, i ako nemamo zakon koji će štititi sve one koji vrijeđaju, negiraju, veličaju, i mi ne možemo kazati da je u Bosni i Hercegovini stanje 
kako treba. It, it concerns me deep, deeply that we, you know, that we don't have the education system that brings this message across, that educates uh, people, young generations, and also that we don't have the uh, appropriate protection for those who deny what was happening uh, in the 90s in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Zamislite, zemlja od 3,5 miliona stanovnika ima tri presednika. Imagine the, the country of 3.5 million people is presided by the presidency with three presidents. Imamo vlada, ni ja ih ne mogu prebrojati koliko ih imamo. We have so many governments that even I myself cannot count them all. Parlamenta, parlamenta skupštine, skupštine imamo. Svaka skupština ima svoj zakon. We have different parliaments, assemblies, and all of them have their laws. Ja kao žrtva genocida u Srebrenci tamo glasam, tamo sam prijavljena. Ja tamo nemam nikakvo pravo. Uh, as, as a victim of genocide, uh, as someone who is uh, having residency within Republika Srpska, in a place where the genocide took place, um, I vote there, but I don't have a feeling that I have any right. Ja kad vadim jedan papir, moram ga platiti, ili često puta kad stojim u redu i dođem da trebam da izvadim papir, kažu pao sistem, došte sutra. Very often I find myself in a situation that when I need certain paper, um, I need to pay for it and then I'm queuing with other people and when I'm due to uh, encounter with the official, I'm informed that the system is down and that I should be coming next day. Dok majka, srpska majka, kad dođe da izvadi papir, ona ne plaća, ona bude uslužena, bude poštovana i to su razlike, velike razlike, znači. At the same time, uh, if a Serbian mother comes to the same office, requires the same paper, she's going to be respected, treated with dignity, and will get the paper immediately. Kaže, njezin sin se je borio za Republiku Srpsku. And yeah, it's because her son was fighting for Republika Srpska. A onda, Daytonom, Republika Srpska, Srpske šume, Srpska voda, Srpska krava pa mora biti srpska munira da bi mogla da tamo živi. And then based on the Dayton, it's Republika Srpska, it's a Serbian forest, it's Serbian water and munira should I guess be a Serbian munira to get the paper. I ponovo kažem bez zakona, bez školstva da djeca znaju pravu istinu i da pišu i da uče ono što je stvarno nema tamo ono što kažu dobroti. And again, without the education, without the law and the education and without teaching kids what has happened, uh, I don't think that the prospects are good. Zato molim sve dobre ljude da nešto se uradi radi naše djece koja ostaju iza nas i da naša djeca imanu bolju, sretniju budućnost. Bosna je lijepa zemlja, možemo svi zajedno živjeti, samo je potrebno malo volje i malo truda i rada. And therefore I ask uh, all well-intended people to make efforts to help us live in a beautiful country that Bosnia Herzegovina is. I think we can live all together with just a little bit of effort. Naše sudije i tužioci, oni su političari, oni nisu pravnici, Our nego judges and prosecutors are politicians. 80% su političari. Our judges and prosecutors are politicians, they are not lawyers. 80% of them are politicians. I nažalost mi žrtve pratimo suđenje i u Bosni i u Beogradu i u Zagrebu i svugdje. And unfortunately we as victims we follow trials in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Croatia, in Serbia. I samo ću vam ispričati nešto što me je strašno povrijedilo na sudu u Beogradu. And I'll tell you something, one story that really hurt me deeply uh, in, during the trial in Belgrade. Um, I'm sorry, but maybe because of time constraints, uh, we can wrap up the comment and then we can take additional questions. We only have 10 minutes before we break. Samo da je molim vas. Just one more sentence. Kad je trebao izaći jedan zločinac koji je bio glavni u Bosni i Hercegovini u Kravici, znato glavni tužlac Kravica, gdje je ubijeno 1316 naše djece iz Srebrenčana, when one uh, indicted person was supposed to take a stand, and it, it's in relation to Kravice, where 1,316 uh, people were killed, kids. When it was asked whether he was guilty or not, he was just being silent. A njegov advokat kaže, on ima potvrdu od doktora da psički nije sposoban da kaže je li kriv ili nije kriv. 
a svaki dan vozi gradski autobus u Beogradu, prevodi građane Beograda, znači i žene i djecu i sve, zato je sposoban a kazati jel kriv nije sposoban. His lawyer at that moment said that uh, his uh, client has a confirmation from a doctor that he is unable to uh, express whether he is guilty or not guilty, yet at the same time that same person on a daily basis is driving a public transportation bus uh, through the streets of Belgrade. So he's capable of doing that, but incapable of saying whether he's guilty or not. Ja se izvinjam što sam odužila, ali htjela sam malo da vi čuju ljudi stvarnost i to je tako. I'm sorry that I took so much time, but I just wanted people to hear what the reality is. Thank you. Hvala vam što ste me slušali. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question from um, Atelia Mulokome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Good, uh, it's afternoon, right? It just looks a bit like morning outside. My name is Atalia Mulokome. I'm from Botswana. I, ju I just want to thank the, the, the panelists very, very much and the moderator for this uh, panel which I think has really thrown light, not just on the legal aspects that we had, you know, some very good presentations about this morning, but also on how then on the ground, how genocide, the different laws, uh, whether they are international or domestic, play out what the impact is and uh, really what it means to people. I, I know that this morning we also heard from a very personal point of view from Nadine, and I must say I thank you as well for this, Nadine. I, you know, it's, it's personal for you, and, and I think from yourself to uh, Prosecutor General, these are experiences that we need to, to, to go through, those of us who come from parts of the world or countries where we have not experienced. We, I meet many Rwandans, and I must say, that the question I'm going to ask, I'm also going to answer to some extent, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because what I would like to know is what lessons, whether it's from the Bosnian example or the Rwandan example, what lessons can we learn going forward? It, despite all the, the provisions of international law uh, relating to the crime of, of genocide, what can we learn as people, as individuals, politically, socially, economically? What can we learn, what lessons can we learn to make sure these things don't happen again? That when they do happen, perpetrators are brought to justice, that deniers are also brought to justice, but also that we prevent this denialism. I'm going to answer it very quickly in the case of Rwanda, because I'm very impressed. I must say that Rwanda has shown leadership in this respect. And I think, and as I say, you'll correct me, I think that there's been an investment by the leadership. You said, all of you, that politicians are often the biggest deniers. But politicians can also be the best solvers of the problem. If they lead by example, if they invest in the way in which I see the president of Rwanda and, and, and his, his government have done, I mean, Rwanda is an impressive example of how you can rise from the ashes of genocide and destruction and, and, and hate and, and all these things. So I just want to say that I think leadership and acceptance, and I must say, I will mention here also because Namibia is next door to Botswana, that when I grew up, we never heard about the Herero genocide that happened during the German occupation. This was only admitted in 2021. I think it's never too late. And there are many situations in history where some genocides happened, and one does hope that we can learn from this and for those perpetrators, whether they are countries or individuals, can come out and do this. So I'm sorry I was long-winded, but I thought I'd just share this. Thank you very, very much for all uh, that you, you've taught us. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we can take um, one more question um, from our online viewers. Um, how can you know if denial laws are effective? Um, maybe we can also hear from the specific context in Rwanda and uh, Bosnia. Um, there is an additional question from the audience. No? Okay. You can, yeah. Yeah, yes. Go, go. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sally Nates, uh, Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, I, th I, I want to just bring, thank you, Munira. I think 
for the panel, esteemed panel, just to, to, to reflect a little bit about the need for recognition before the law and denial. So recognition of what happened, what is happening, before we go immediately to the law, and if you can make those connections of how do we still work on recognition uh, of genocide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ndaritu, would you like to start with at least the second question of how effective are genocide denial laws in your experience, um, considering the visits that you've made to both Bosnia and Rwanda? Um, Thank you. I would say that um, the law that the High Representative Christian Schmidt spoke about, the genocide in our law of uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, um, that uh, I was part of the whole discussion with the former um, High Representative, uh, Mr. Insko, in terms of whether it should be created or not. And uh, I went to Bosnia Herzegovina and we had the whole discussion in terms of what does it look like, should it be created, should it not be. And we researched um, greatly, we invested in huge amounts of research um, to, in terms of countries that have, um, especially Holocaust denial laws, of which there are quite a number here in Europe, um, which have the same concept. We looked at um, Rwanda, uh, which had a genocide denial law already, and we looked at what people were saying in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What, the, what did they want? And part of what was coming across, um, especially from Republica Srpska then, was that um, that they, they didn't want a law that just recognized genocide denial, that uh, the war crimes, denial of war crimes had to be recognized as well. So that um, the advice that then I gave to the former high representative was that uh, that needs to be considered. And the way things were at that time, uh, because so much of this is about politics, um, the way it was being put out, it was being put out to look like if you have a law that says a denial of genocide and war crimes, uh, that that's acceptable. Um, and ultimately, of course, um, he passed the law. But just before he passed the law, he again asked, um, what do you really think? And I told him, if you don't pass this law, you'll spend the rest of your life wondering what would have happened if you had. So just go ahead and do it. And so um, we saw the immediate results um, of uh, the passing of the law, like hate speech went down like immediately, like um, it was virtually impossible to open a newspaper in, in Bosnia Herzegovina without seeing anything, or in the Balkans, you know, in, in Belgrade, especially in Serbia, without seeing um, any hate speech, and it immediately went down before it started coming back up again. But the immediate reaction was, was, was very strong. So in terms of, um, of, 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 of genocide um, denial, I think um, for, for Rwanda as well as uh, for Bosnia Herzegovina, um, we always um, talk, um, give examples of, of, of Germany, um, what happened to Germany after um, the, the World War, after the Holocaust, and what happened in like rooms like we are in right now. And um, we speak about um, the, the, the legal measures being um, complemented by that broader ecosystem, the education system. And um, I was especially struck, like um, walking in Berlin, seeing on the street uh, those plaques on the ground that this family lived here and was taken away from here. And what struck me was actually not even so much the plaques, but the knowledge that I came to know later that it's not the government that put them there, that it's uh, ordinary people who put them there. So just thinking about that whole ecosystem that's required to support this genocide in our laws, which are necessary because, as uh, we keep saying, um, that genocide denial really speaks to that intent to commit another genocide, and it's actually, as Saj keeps saying, continuation of, of, uh, of the genocide. That um, the lessons learned from that is that uh, we do need those laws. 
um, and look at um, the consideration that we don't have those arguments of whether we need the Holocaust denial laws um, or we don't here in Europe. People know we need them. People know that uh, we do need them, and of course, with full respect for freedom of expression um, but in, in human rights, international human rights, but we do know that those laws are important. In terms of even the knowledge, even the knowledge that, if, um, that there needs to be such a law, but also in terms of uh, one of the things that we don't often recognize, of what happens when somebody is taken before a court of law, that it's not just about that person being taken before that court of law, that there is a whole discussion that goes out in wider society about why that person is standing in the dock, which is why it's so important, this room is so important when we imagine uh, Goering, for example, sitting right there, thinking about the lessons that came from that, thinking about the training manuals that were informed by the mere fact of somebody sitting or standing there that it's absolutely important that we have this genocide denial loss. And also thinking about the fact that the international community failed Bosnia-Herzegovina, failed Rwanda, and that the aspect of having genocide denial laws can step into that space of ensuring that we do not fail again. Much. Um, Dr. Bramatz, maybe you can address the last question on recognition of uh, what happened before, before um, law comes in very briefly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I really think that the, the international criminal justice system is very much concentrated much more on the perpetrator than on, on the victims. Um, you know, when perpetrators are uh, arrested, of course, very often their defense is paid. Um, they have, of course, all, all the medical attention, they have all their rights uh, perfectly well, well protected. Uh, and definitely at the Atok Tribunal, we know that there's no participation of, of survivors uh, in the proceedings. So, so reparation, compensation, I think is an extremely important element in recognition uh, of the victimhood in addition to the denial of genocide, which comes at the very, very later stage. So I think it's, um, and as Alice has said, you know, uh, especially when we as prosecutors are coming in, we are coming in when it's too late, right? When prevention has failed and we are looking for, for accountability. And uh, I, I fully agree with Alice, you know, early warning systems, well, they've also failed because for uh, Srebrenica, for, for Rwanda, there, were enough, there was enough early warning and the international community has not really reacted. So at the end of the day, uh, I think what is important is responsible leadership. The example was taken in, in Rwanda. The contrary example can be, be seen in Bosnia and Herzegovina where unfortunately um, you are more easily elected as a politician by insisting on what makes a difference between you and the other groups than by insisting on what is uniting a community uh, to move forward together. At the end of the day, it's all about education. We wanted to have education being also an element in our discussion here. Well, um, we, we don't have uh, time, but I'm sure education as really the central piece in everything we are discussing today will, will come up in other panels as well. Thank you. Very much. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Schmidt and uh, Mr. Prosecutor General, very briefly, last final words on the question of lessons learned in the Bosnian context and the Rwandan context. Mr. Schmidt, please. Thank you. Lesson, lessons learned, I would say, for the other parts of the world, um, look on non-discrimination. Uh, the example Munira has shown, uh, has, has uh, said, shows that uh, we have a lack, uh, a wonderful Dayton made uh, ceasefire, no war again, but it did not answer the question uh, of non-discrimination individually. It answered the question ethnically, ethnic groups, but not individually. I say today, individual protection and possibility to get its right for everybody is m as well important as a balance between ethnic uh, groups. So we have uh, to look on this. Uh, Bosnia, with this huge number of governments and parliaments and uh, public uh, services, uh, has too much 
public influence, where loyalty comes closer to those who are deciding to get your job or not, instead of having a civic society. Uh, this would be the first and international and transparency. Nationally, as somebody uh, who had the honor in recent years to be in the process of redefining the structure of the United Nations. You remember, those were the good old days where we thought um, that uh, the eternal peace would come and uh, that um, we would have no problems to discuss. There we thought about, not only me, but uh, uh, Boutrous Ghali and uh, uh, and, and, and some others, Article 41, to have this um, uh, possibility to act, yes. But uh, um, except this wonderful work and important work um, Madame Nderitu uh, can deliver, I think we should assist her and us ourselves with a worldwide early warning system and develop on the indicators, what are the indicators where we see that a society uh, could be um, moving into a genocidal situation. Uh, this is easy to be said, complicated to say, but I think basically you feel structures and you see structures and sometimes you know structures. And if we are acting as late as in the national community did in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, it's too late. So I think have an early warning system um, and have structures of analysis and to say then, let's come to uh, uh, action. This will be complicated every time, I know, but if you don't start, you have lost already. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Prosecutor General, final words. What are the lessons learned? The history and uh, what is happening now in the world can show us that the divisionism uh, can happen everywhere. And if the divisionism can happen everywhere, it means that even genocide can happen everywhere. So it is the responsibility of everyone to fight anything that can lead uh, to genocide, including denial of genocide. Another re lesson that we can learn is that uh, consequences of genocide also reach to those who committed a genocide, not only in terms of punishment, but in, in terms of psychological, their mind, they never live a happy life because they know that they tracked. I think Serge knows it's because he's an expert in tracking <laughs> those who committed a genocide. They never live a happy life. So uh, it's something that people should not joke with. That's the reason why countries should condemn and enact laws punishing genocide, denial, and related, related crime. It's the responsibility of everyone. The second thing is that uh, people should think there are some countries that harbor the genocide, those who committed a genocide, and they, they are not doing anything to extradite or to, to punish those people who are still at large. So you can't fight uh, genocide, denial, when you cannot hold accountable those who committed, uh, those who committed genocide. And uh, she talked about the investment by the leadership, and Rwanda is uh, really an example. The first in investment is sacrifice. Uh, particularly in Rwanda, victims and survivors, they live next to each other. So there's that sacrifice of those victims because they are determined to build uh, their nation. And you have to take into consideration, uh, consideration that the general interests prevail over some uh, personal interests, and that's patriotism. 
And that, that's one of the investment uh, on the leadership. Uh, in relation to the other question related to uh, recognition, genocide has diverse consequences which are psychological, physical, and financial. So recognition on the psychological aspect is to allow those victims and survivors and give time, the time to remember and mourn those who were killed. And recognizing also the responsibility of the people who committed the genocide and fight the culture of impunity. In relation to the physical consequence, you have to take measures to address issues that those people have. And in relation to financial, I think as it has just been mentioned, this is related to reparation and we have time to discuss about it. But I do agree with her that recognition is a prerequisite of fighting genocide denial. Uh, and I can't uh, close without uh, taking this time, this opportunity to also thank the Nuremberg Academy for <coughs> inviting me so that we can discuss together and uh, share the experience of Rwanda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so this brings to a close the second panel. I would like to thank each and every panelist um, on the second panel for a very enlightening discussion and very interesting perspectives um, from Bosnia and um, Rwanda. Um, I think they do deserve a round of applause. So. Um, thank you very much. And Alexander, I will take it back from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darlene. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I think it is fair and true to say that the gravity of the situation in those countries was palpable and could be felt in the air in this room. And as heavy as these subjects are, it is necessary to listen to those experiences. And I believe strongly that our experts here, our panelists, have made their points and have made it palpable, like I said. Now, before I release all of you into lunch, I would like to once again release the results of the motion. <laughs> Anti-denial laws protect societies effectively. Now, that is a very fascinating result. Either only two people voted, or it really was just as divisive. So, with this result, I release all of you into lunchtime, and I will see you afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>